Welcome everyone. I am Amanda Clark, the Library Director at Whitworth University, and I am here to welcome you all this morning. Welcome to the talks and colloquies on the topic of Christian churches in China, design, use, and representation. I'll be running tech support today as well, so if you need anything, let me know. First, I'd really like to acknowledge the sponsors of this symposium. That would be Clarence Simpson of the English department formerly at Whitworth University and Fenton Duval at the uh, history department at Whitworth University. These two 20th century professors established this annual lecture series, although this is the first time it's on Zoom, and they co-founded Whitworth's core curriculum on worldview and philosophy. With their degrees from UPenn and Stanford, they established this endowment to discuss important issues and pursue transformative ideas. So for the next three days, scholars will engage the issue of Christian church architecture in China in an open-ended fashion anchored in the common reading of two essays written by the Dutch Benedictine monk and church architect uh, Edelbert Gresnicht, who studied Chinese architecture and formulated his own theories about what he called a Sino-Christian synthesis. Each scholar will present on a topic related to Christian church architecture in China, followed by a response by another scholar. If you, the audience, have some questions, feel free to put those in the chat typed out and uh, we'll keep track of those. These talks will be recorded and made available for scholarly consultation after the fact. And we are recording today, so please keep your voice and video muted. I will now hand this over to Anthony Clark, my esteemed husband, for a brief introduction of our first speaker. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, if you can hear me, please, maybe thumbs up. Good, excellent. So uh, good morning. Uh, very briefly, before I introduce Dr. Kumans, I should say that in the introductions, for the sake of time, I won't be providing a very long introduction. I'll just introduce the name and the institution of the speaker. And, uh, and then we will listen to the speaker uh, as she or he provides uh, her or his presentation. Um, just, I should also note, uh, there are in中国大陆的人, Zhao上好, in欧洲的人, Wan上好. So it, for those who are also, I guess maybe in China, it should be Wan上好. Um, it's very late in China. Welcome to everyone who is in Europe, who is in China. I know there are people really literally from almost every continent who have joined us today. So uh, welcome to all of you. To begin, uh, this, this symposium is Professor Thomas Kumans from the University of Leuven, who will give us an introduction to the work of Edelbert Gresnik, and he will pronounce his name correctly, as uh, I'm certain the rest of us will pronounce it in our very Anglophone way. So, Professor Kumans, welcome. So, hi, everybody. I was asked to uh, give a small, a brief introdu introduction about Father Edelbert Gresnicht, and to um, briefly introduce his background, uh, because he only stayed for five years of his life in China. And the main question is why? Has he been invited to come to China? And what has he done after his stay in China? And uh, why was a man who was not an architect invited to China to create a new architectural style? So my purpose is, is here to um, introduce you in 10 minutes with 10 slides, starting with this um, um, double pictures where on the two images you see Edelbert Gresnik sitting. On the left side, it's a detail of a beautiful painting uh, by Maurice Denis uh, from 1913, when he's a young monk learning art in the Abbey of Beuron in Germany. And uh, the picture on the right, he is in Beijing, uh, dressed uh, with Chinese dress, dressed in 1930, uh, a little bit later. So my first point is the name. What's in a name? Well, it's a difficult name to pronounce. The right name is Adelbert Gresnicht, that is with a Dutch accent. 
uh, even though it's a German name, which is uh, written in a Dutch way, so without a CH with a G at the end. Nevertheless, you will often find his name mentioned as Adalbert Gresnicht with CH or Adalberto Gresnich without a T. So all this is wrong, but he was talking about 10 different languages and I think he had fun with that. But for a historian, of course, you need a right spelling. And I show you here some proofs of what is his right name. You see his signature, Adalbert Gresnicht, his uh, Mingpian uh, from Beijing, uh, Don Adalbert Gresnicht, his Chinese name, uh, Ge Li Se, and uh, here is his necrology, Adalbert Gresnicht. So let's use that way of writing and spelling his name over all the other. Secondly, he was a Benedictine, that means a who usually has the stability in one abbey. But in his case, he was a Benedictine globetrotter. I tried to summarize his life uh, on this timeline. He lived the 78 years, born in Holland. He was a Dutchman in 1877. And, um, he passed away in 1957 in Belgium. But in the meantime, he spent his life in several countries, in Belgium, in Germany, in Italy, in Brazil, in the United States, in China, and in Italy. Uh, I will not enter in the detail of all the stages of his life, but the main reason why he moved and he traveled and he stayed long times in other countries were related with his work as an artist. He was commissioned to decorate abbey churches of the Benedictine order. Uh, first, when he, he entered very young in the Abbey of Maritsu in Belgium, he was 15 as an oblate. Then he spent two years in the Abbey of Beuron in Germany where there was a famous art school. I will come back later on this. Then he came back to Maretsu. He studied uh, philosophy and theology and was ordained a priest in uh, 1903. And thereafter, he was immediately sent to Italy, to Monte Cassino, to make the decoration of the crypt of the founding father of the Benedictines, that is the crypt of Saint Benedict. You see the second picture uh, under. Uh, he is um, sculpting one of the friezes of this uh, crypt. Spent 10 years for sculpting that frieze. Then after he, went sent, he was sent to Sao Paulo in, in, in Brazil for painting the Benedictine Abbey Church of Sao Paulo. And from there he moved to New York to paint also the inner decoration of the Church of the Benedictines in the Bronx in New York. And it is when he was in New York that he was, um, well, contacted from by Bishop Costantini, who invited him to uh, Beijing, where he stayed from 1927 to January 1932, uh, a very short time. He traveled one year in the States and then went back to Italy for a long time, where he was, uh, well, making the decoration of the Dutch college and other works. And finally, he went back to Belgium in 1949 after having gotten a stroke, he was nearly blind and he went back to his mother abbey where he nearly never lived and it was for entering the infirmary. So in fact, he was totally unknown in his own community because he never stayed there, but he is buried in Maritsu and his uh, very fragmentary archives are kept in uh, that abbey too. Three. The Boron Benedictine Art School is a very important art movement that has been studied by scholars, as you can see from the different uh, books here in Italian, in German, in English. Uh, and this is a, a movement in art that has been founded by the monk Desiderius Lenz, that is the old monk on the painting. And uh, he developed a decoration art that is very hieratic, symbolic, based on symmetry, with some references to Egyptian art, 
but based on the perfection of compositions, the kind of ideal canon and art and proportions. And uh, that art will receive a certain audience uh, well, around 1900 in the context of the general movement of uh, symbolism. And the painting you've seen, that beautiful painting with the, the three monks of Beuron, has been painted by Maurice Denis, a French symbolist, who visited the crypt of uh, Monte Cassino under construction and met Desiderius Lenz, but also these two young Dutch monks. One is Adelbert Gresnicht, the one who is looking to you, facing you, and the other one is Willebrocht Verkade, who was a friend of Paul Gauguin and who had been an abyss painter from the school of Pont Aven in Brittany, and then turned his life and became a Benedictine and entered Beuron as a painter and abandoned completely his Nabis style for becoming an important Beuron style painter. But Gresnicht is the one who will spread that art to other continents, to South America, to North America, and well, to a certain extent to China. Three of his major works, the crypt of St. Benedict in Monte Cassino, 1913, the picture you see on the front, there he is sculpting because he's a sculptor, a painter, and also making mosaics. The picture to the right is a view, uh, in a view of one of the chapels of the um, church in Sao Paulo. And to the left is his most prestigious work, which is the tomb of Pope Pius XI in the grottos of the Vatican. So I insist on this because all his artistic life has been very coherent, completely devoted to painting and sculpture in the style of Beuron. And there is only one exception that are the four years he went to China and where he was asked to design architecture. So that is really a parenthese, a small moment in his life, but that, ha that uh, has to be contextualized on this way. A main, a key person in his life is just Chelsea two minutes. Martini. Just two minutes, sorry. Yes. Just two minutes <laughs> left. Yes. Uh, important person in his life is Celso Costantini, who he met in Monte Cassino, and who later invite him to come to uh, China. Later, when back to Rome. Uh, Gresnicht will also meet him again at the Vatican and uh, teach in the school of the Propaganda Fide. Costantini tried to find an able artist for designing his Chino Christian art he wanted to develop in uh, China. These are two uh, quotes. From the first article Costantini wrote on Sino-Christian art in the Ecclesiastical Review from 1923, and where he ended his quote with the aim of requiring of finding an able artist. He had not found one. And he tried to find the artist who would be a Chinese Catholic and architect. But in 1923, there were not a lot of Chinese architects and there were no Catholic Chinese architects interested to do that. That is why later, in 1925, desesperating to find a Chinese architect, he, remi he remembered his friend Adelbert Gresnicht and invited him to come to... Uh, um, how can I, I have... I have a bar through my screen with... I can't read... Ah, okay. Uh, and this is, this is important to understand the spirit of how Adelbert Gresnicht was um, uh, perceived in China. Adelbert Gresnicht is a famous artist monk of the Benedictine school of Beuron. 
He labored for years on the decoration of the crypt of the Abbey of Monte Cassino in Italy. He is an intimate friend of Archbishop Costantini, who believes that the Gothic and Romanesque should not be used for ecclesiastical buildings in China, but that the native Chinese architecture should be adapted for this purpose. Costantini is anxious, therefore, that Don Adel Edelbert should inaugurate such a Sino-Christian style, and here the word is used. Don Adelbert will hmm, uh, draw the plans for the future building of the Catholic University in Beijing. He is at the origin of the birth of this style. And we have a certain number, I found a certain number of sketches where it is fascinating to see how a painter is trying to define an architectural style. And that is not by doing plans, it is by drawing elevations. This is really like paintings, it is by drawing the face of the building. We will come back later on this very important point. Next page. In China, where he stayed for a short time, he designed four buildings that have been realized. The Fuzhen University in Beijing, we will see that later, as well as three other educational buildings, the regional seminary in Kaifeng in Henan, the South, regional, regional, South China Regional Seminary in Hong Kong, and the seminary of the disciples of the Lord in Xuanhua. So he designed these buildings, but he has not built them. He never see these buildings completed. The only building he's seen complete was the University of Beijing because he was living there. This is a detail of the different buildings he designed, he built with the dates and the different people involved. And the interesting point is to see that most people involved are from the inner circle of Celso Costantini, being Italian uh, bishops or being three of the six uh, first Chinese bishops or um, consecrated in 1926. All the buildings were designed but not realized. Slide nine, Gresnik as a writer, he wrote two articles, you know these two articles, but in fact, these articles were also translated into French, where a little bit different content and the illustration is different. But my point here is that I have some questions about the authorship of these articles, because Gresnicht was not a writer, not a writer of letters, not a writer of texts. I have some anecdotes about that. And uh, these articles here have to be understood as being very close to the ideas and the ideology of and the propaganda of uh, Costantini. But Costantini needed a face of a Benedictine monk artist to spread his ideas. So this is a point I'm launching now, and I'm sure we will uh, talk about that uh, later. Uh, in 1932, he left China and made a one-year fundraising tour to the United States. And thereafter, he went to Rome, where he never did anything Chinese anymore and never designed any architecture. In 1940, Celso Costantini, in a famous book on Christian art in mission fields, writes about uh, Gresnicht, Dom Edelbert certainly shaped his constructions with elements of traditional art, but he infused them with a new soul, the Christian soul, which brings to life everything it touches. Dom Edelbert's constructions blend harmoniously with Chinese landscapes, but are not an exhumation or adapted copies. They are an act of rebirth, resplendent, with the real life of art. This is summarizing the point of view of Costantini. So to wrap up this very short introduction, 
with the different points, well, you see how central the role of Celso Costantini has been in Adelbert Gresnik's life, um, and uh, how the different moments of his life are interconnected, but how Celso Costantini is connected to his life as a globetrotter, to his work as an artist, to the birth of Sino-Christian style, to Gresnik's buildings, his writings, and we could say that he made Adelbert Gresnik an agent of Roman enculturation policy, of his enculturation policy in China. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kumans. Excellent.